Good morning and welcome to this Remembrance Sunday service from Holy Apostles Charlton Kings and St Michael's Wadden here in Cheltenham. Uh, a warm welcome to you if you're a member of our churches, a big hello to all the children of the churches and uh, if you are tuning in from further afield you're especially welcome this morning. If you'd like to know anything else about what we do as churches at Holy Apostles or St Michael's please do feel free to get in touch. You can contact me directly on ashley at holyapostles.org.uk or through the church office on churchoffice at holyapostles.org.uk. We'd love to answer any questions you've got about us as uh, churches. A, a couple of notices. Um, the service this morning will have an act of remembrance with a time of silence within it, but we're aiming to finish the service actually before 11 o'clock because the Royal British Legion and others have suggested that uh, we might stand in our doorways of our homes at 11 o'clock for two minutes quiet. So the intention is that we'll finish this service in time to allow you to be able to do that if you want to. Uh, we've also got a midday Zoom today at uh, midday, which will be an agape meal. So if you're a member of the church, you should have had uh, the bulletin sent out to you, which has the connection details for that. So please do join us if you'd like at midday today uh, for that. Um, lockdown news is on our Facebook page. Take a look at that if uh, you want to catch up with where we are at the moment in terms of uh, church services and praying in the building, that kind of thing. Uh, final thing to say is please do, if you haven't already, click the subscribe button below and uh, then click the little bell and we will notify you every time we put a new service, uh, a new video up online on our channel. All the words for the service are on the screen, so please do join in with them if you wish. Let's take a little quiet as we begin. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. Amen. Here's our opening song. love vast as the ocean loving kindness as the flood when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood who is love will not remember who can see Here at Royal Marines 
Ulster and Scotland. Remembrance Weekend, my Catholic faith, reminds me of sacrifice. The sacrifice displayed by Christ on the cross is reflected in the ultimate sacrifice given by the servicemen and women who serve this country. My name is Petra Oyston and I work in the Scientific Civil Service at the Defence Science and Technology Laboratories at Porton Down. We undertake science and technology research to provide our armed forces with enhanced capability and, at the end of the day, to save lives. So what does my faith mean to me at this time of remembrance? Well, when we lose somebody, yes, it's very sad, but when we have faith that they're going to heaven and they're going to be reunited with our Father, then there is consolation and healing, and that's what my faith means to me. My name is Wing Commander Jake McAllister and I'm an I-Star pilot in the Royal Air Force. I'm currently based at the Permanent Joint Headquarters at Northwood, but right now I'm in my service family's accommodation, which is my home. And I've been working here on and off for the last six months because of coronavirus. The service family's accommodation, even though it's our home, is our firm base for the family, which is really critical to our Christian faith. At this time of year, it's really important for families to pray together, whether they're deployed or at home, as that's the lifeblood of the church. I am uh, Joe uh, Baka Dokaivalu. I am originally from uh, Fiji. I am uh, stationed in the uh, Land Warfare Center. I am with the Methodist uh, Fellow uh, Church and uh, also heading up the uh, Fijian Methodist Fellowship rather around the southern part of uh, England. Faith uh, in God means a lot uh, to me. I believe whenever I am uh, facing uh, different circumstances or in troubles at times, that is where the God that I believe begins all his uh, miracle works. Uh, for Remembrance this week, Beanie has produced a couple of videos for our children and you can find those on this YouTube channel in their own playlists under uh, Mini Club and Sunday Club. Uh, so do take a look at those if you want to do something uh, with your children in particular. You can pause this and go and look at them, uh, but of course you might miss the 11 o'clock if you do that, so you might want to do it later on. But please do take a look. Um, as we come before God uh, in a, a service like this, we're often reminded of how we fall short of God's ideal for us. And so it's right at the start to, to take a few moments and give to God all the regrets that we carry. I'm going to put some words up on the service now. And if uh, you are in a place where you want to let go of uh, anything that you have done or said that you shouldn't have actually anything that's been done to you that is a burden you're carrying, then why not say these words as a way of giving that to God? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his Spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, before the next song, Richard Rawlings is going to bring us uh, a short reflection. Good morning. I always find Remembrance Sunday uh, very meaningful, very poignant. Not that I've ever been uh, in the military, nor had any wartime sort of experience, as indeed most of us, uh, the vast majority of people in this country, have not actually experienced war on our home territory, uh, and what a blessing that is. Um, but I'm always very minded at this time of year of my grandfather, Charles Rawlings. 
He was born in 1895, I think, um, and I knew him. I, I think he died when I was about 15, actually. Um, but he is uh, quite a, <clears throat> a war hero in a way. He's one of the few people who survived both the Somme and Gallipoli uh, and won two military crosses uh, for bravery uh, during those um, campaigns. Um, and uh, obviously, I was never in that terrible situation. It's unimaginable for most of us, the incredible difficulty, distress, agony, pain, and awful situation they found themselves in. <clears throat> and he would tell me stories of how, and, and this was not with any sort of embellishment or any, any pride. It was always very quiet. Uh, you had to eke it out of him, actually. Most of these soldiers would never speak of it. Um, but he would say how they lived for weeks drinking water out of puddles and eating rats, shooting rats with their pistols uh, as the only source of, of meat they could actually get. It was horrific conditions. And uh, he came over actually from New Zealand in the New Zealand Expeditionary Force. Um, and that's why he found himself in both those campaigns. Um, ended up returning home wounded uh, with a exploding dum-dum bullet in his shoulder that he received when uh, retrieving a senior officer who'd uh, been injured in a, a, a shell hole. And he, he, there happened to be a wheelbarrow nearby. He pulled him out of that and with the wheelbarrow took him across the mud under fire uh, and got shot himself. And that's one of, one of his medals. But uh, that, that's not really the, the issue today, although I'd like to think he, he'd like someone to remember that. Um, but the, the thing that strikes me is his testimony uh, and how we can rely on the people we know to sort of give us a, a fair indication of how things were. And I, of course, believe his testimony completely without question. Uh, and, and it's interesting, it, it's difficult for us to believe sometimes how awful it was. And I don't know if you've seen that amazing film uh, where they've actually uh, recolored the black and white images uh, of the First World War and how that really brings it to life. They've dubbed sound over it with the type of things they were expecting that, that they would say or they've lip read. Um, and what a wonderful way of bringing that to life. Because before then, it was only just a, a grainy black and white thing. It was in the past. It didn't really seem relevant um, but the minute you put sound and color into it it brings it to life without that all we really had to go on was the testimony of the people who were there and that makes me think you know what the importance of testimony is is so critical in our faith and these stories in the Bible, some of them appear far-fetched, difficult to believe. Can we really believe the people who were there at the time, the people who wrote those stories? Um, <clears throat> because it's 2,000 years ago. How can we trust them? Well, just like I can trust the testimony of my grandfather because he was there, I happened to be alive at the time when he was alive. I was a young boy, he was an old man. Um, and how fortunate that is. But all these things that really happened, we just didn't happen to be there at the time. The timing was wrong for us. We're 2,000 years too late. And we've had to rely on the testimony of the people who were there. And I find that the more you rely on that and you begin to, to trust those testimonies, the, the more you get to know those disciples and, and the apostles, the people who wrote the stories of the Bible, and you accept that these things are true because you get to know them. And if only we'd been there, if only, be, if only Paul was with us right now, he'd be telling us not just a 2,000 year old story, he'd be with us, not in black and white, in color, enthusiastically telling us about all the things that Jesus did. He really did, he really was on the Sermon on the, the Mount and, and at the wedding and all the wonderful, incredible, vibrant, happy and sad stories that we have from the Bible. People were there, and if they were being with us right now, they would be enthusiastic beyond measure. So my message today really is let us share that enthusiasm for the testimony that has come from the people who were there, not just of those wars gone by and the few remaining people who remember any major campaigns, but the people who were there during biblical times and how meaningful and special that can be when we believe those stories ourselves and we bring them to life through their testimony. So I'd like to thank God for the testimony of the people who were there at the time. Everyone needs compassion 
passion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Whether it's an actual mountain, a hospital, or simply holding down a job and raising a family. Or maybe it's even battling through the bottom field on the commando test. Because really Everest is just a state of mind. I was lucky many years ago to stand on the summit of the world's highest peak, And it was extraordinary. You see the curvature of the earth at the edges, and you're aware you're truly somewhere special. On that mountain, I experienced my own doubts, being silenced, drowned out by something better, something stronger, by a presence that is sometimes hard to describe. But what I do know is that I've lent on my Christian faith in the grimmest of moments. The universal presence of the Almighty, empowering, quiet, strong, personal, even when I feel truly broken. A secret strength and eternal backbone. For me, faith is like a point of awareness and a starting place of all true adventure. As I once saw written on an old wooden cross in a small mountain chapel, these words, Christ beside me, Christ within me, Christ to shield me, and Christ to win. Truly something for all of us within the Commando family to take strength from during the times of testing. 
effort. A prayer for the army. O God the Father and protector of all, we pray for all who serve in the army, for their families, friends, and all affected by the demands of military life. We pray especially for all those who are separated from loved ones through deployments, exercises, and training, and those who this day will face danger for our peace. Defend them with your heavenly grace. Strengthen them in their trials and temptations. Give them courage to face the challenges of each day and grant them a sense of your enduring presence wherever they may be. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A prayer for the RAF. Father God, in your hands is the life of every living thing. We pray that you would strengthen and protect all who serve in the Royal Air Force and by your presence draw close to their families and friends. Be close to those who are far from home this day, with those who face danger and uncertainty and with those who sacrifice their lives and their freedoms for the protection and security of others. Give to our airmen and women strength, courage and hope this day as they serve your cause of justice and peace to the honour and glory of your holy name. Amen. A prayer for the civil service. Our Heavenly Father, we uphold in prayer all those who serve our nation in the MOD civil service. Together with all those serving in government departments, May they continue to work with honesty and impartiality in supporting the operational success of our armed forces. We remember especially those civil servants deployed alongside service personnel in remote locations and on military operations around the globe. Protect and guide them in all their dealings as they work for good of peoples on the earth. In Christ's name we ask this. Amen. A prayer for the Royal Navy. O eternal Lord God, creator of sea, air and land, we pray for your protection for the men and women of the naval service. For those in positions of command, we ask for wisdom, courage and diligence. For our sailors, airmen and Royal Marines serving around the globe today, we pray for courage, determination, unselfishness and cheerfulness in the face of adversity. For the families of those serving, we ask for protection and comfort in separation. For those serving and for veterans facing physical and mental challenges, we pray for your strength and perseverance. Amen.
Hello, my name's uh, Philip Amy and I'm a chaplain in the Royal Navy. I've been doing this for three and a half years. We have a varied amount of jobs and roles available. We go on warships such as the one we're on today and we support on deployments and various activities of the Royal Navy. And we also work shoreside on the base units, again, supporting personnel with day-to-day -day issues and life. I think remembrance is important because in some strange sense, it actually gives us hope and it's not hope as in terms of wishful thinking, it's a hope centred on a faithful God. And it's a hope that those who died in conflict, who made the ultimate sacrifice, didn't do so in vain. It's a hope centred on God that they are now at peace and rest with him. And it's a hope centred on everything we do here on board and across the Royal Navy that is always done in the pursuit of peace. Hello, this is Padre Justin Bradbury. I'm chaplain to the 1st Battalion, the Coldstream Guards here in Windsor. And my huge privilege is to walk alongside families and soldiers in various circumstances of life. So I get to laugh with them and cry with them. I've been here since September 2018 and I'm really coming of age. And rather than doing a lot of wandering, although I still do that, very often people seek me out these days. That's a huge privilege, as I say, to listen, to hear people at depth. When many people are so pressed with time, my great challenge and the great privilege is to give people time. When it comes to remembrance, when it comes to recalling at this time of year, my opportunity with people is to slow down and to pause. We fear being forgotten. We fear being overlooked. And when you speak to a soldier, to families about loss, about someone who's died, their great fear is that their loved one will be forgotten. And so we promise we will remember them. What shall separate us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing is the answer, nothing, if we are found in Jesus Christ. So no matter what losses we face, no matter what hardships we face, nothing is lost and everything is found in Jesus Christ. And so I approach remembrance with hope as well as sadness. My name is uh, Johnny Mbayo, though I prefer just calling me John because some people can't pronounce my name. They think maybe I'm from Scotland. I am a chaplain here at RIF Coningsby in Lincolnshire. I'm one of the chaplains. We have uh, three chaplains. For me, Remembrance is really uh, a personal archive where I'm able to reflect and be thankful um, not only to the men and women who gave so much for, for our peace and security and all that we enjoy, but also it's a time to sit back and keep alive the memories of those who have given much and also uh, it's a time to just bring before God the men and women who have given so much. So it's a time of reflection, it's a time of gratitude, it's a time of also commemorating and keeping alive the memories of those who have gone before us. The reading comes from Joshua, chapter 4, verses 1 to 9 and verse 24. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests stood, and to carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. 
So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp, where they put them down. Joshua set up 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. He did this so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Well, thank you to Sue for the reading. Uh, Sue is particularly poignant for her because she had two grandfathers who both served in the First World War and her father served in Bomber Command in the Second World War with 49 sorties over enemy territory. Uh, I have links, of course, my father was in the First World War, my only uncle on my mother's side was killed in the RAF. So we have special memories and so have you. Many of you will have all sorts of connections in your families with folks who suffered and uh, fought and in some cases died in war. Now, when we come to this reading, it's a very interesting and exciting time for the people of Israel. They've had 40 long years of slogging around the wilderness. And at last, under their new army commander, their captain in chief, their national leader, Joshua, who's taken over from Moses, they are entering the promised land. And they entered it by crossing the River Jordan to Jericho. Problem was, the River Jordan uh, was deep and wide. And in a miraculous way, God stopped the waters. And the order was for the priests to carry the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, across uh, the river, uh, the dry river bed. The river would dry up as it did. And uh, these 12 uh, leaders, or priests, uh, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, were also to be followed by 12 men who were picked out, uh, leaders to carry 10 stones, or 12 stones rather, across the riverbed. And then when they got across, they were to set them up permanently uh, as a memorial. They set up this uh, memorial uh, stone tablet uh, with the instruction that when in future descendants, children to follow would say, what do these stones mean? Uh, they would say, God did this wonderful thing. God showed his power. He brought the people out of uh, one side of the river to the other and into the promised land. What do these stones mean? Verse 24, tell them so that everyone may know that the Lord is powerful. What do these stones mean? I'm thinking now of this in the context of uh, Remembrance Sunday. A few years ago, two or three years ago, Sue and I were in Collinsay, which is a very small island, about three miles by one mile wide. And it's just off the coast of Scotland north of the island, uh, larger island of Isla. We were there for the day, and as we got to the boat to take us back to Isla, we were standing by a column, really a large stone cross, on which were the names of men who had died in the First World War. What st st staggered me about it was there were about 19 names there. Some of them uh, were, were names obviously from the same family, repeat names. And I thought to myself, of a tiny island like this. Here are 19 young men. Many of them probably would never ever have thought of going to the mainland in their lifetime. But they were conscripted, they were called up into the army, they, they traveled over to the mainland, they went through England, across the channel into France and, and died. Young men, farmers, fishermen, ordinary folk, giving their lives in a cause. Now, why did it happen? What was it all about? Why is it that all over the world there are Commonwealth War Grave Commission uh, cemeteries in, in many, many countries, especially, of course, uh, in France and Belgium and in this country, and that these Commonwealth War Graves are all in, alike. They all look exactly the same. And many people will go along to ordinary churchyard and they will pick out perhaps a solitary Commonwealth War Grave stone and say, what does this mean? What it means is that someone somewhere gave their lives in war. Memorials. We see them in villages, we see them in towns. Nearly every hamlet or town or village in this country has a war memorial. 
What do they mean? Several things. One of the things they mean is that conscripted, voluntary or regular service people have given their lives for a common national cause. They mean from time to time that some megalomaniac, some land grabber, some warmonger has decided to use his power in order to bring a whole nation into conflict with other nations. It means six million Jews were killed because of one man's obsession uh, with his hatred of Jewry. It means 50 million lives were lost in the Second World War. And history shows that peoples of the world, led by strong men, have always been brought into war, mayhem and suffering. At that terrible camp, Auschwitz in Poland, where so many people suffered and died, there is a memorial inscription which says this. It's the words of a Spanish philosopher and writer, Centenaria, and he said this. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. National leaders and governments need to take note of that, do they not? What do these stones mean? What do these memorials mean? They mean that just a tiny group of a large nation can cause suffering for so many. The farmer, the fisherman, the school teacher, the business person, the ordinary men and women of the country, their lives are disrupted. Henry Scott Holland, the Reverend Henry Scott Holland, a uh, hundred and so years ago, wrote a hymn. It's called, it's entitled Judge Eternal Throned in Splendour, but it has this verse. Still the weary folks are pining for the hour that brings release, and the city's crowded clangour cries aloud for sin to cease, and the homesteads and the woodlands plead in silence for their peace. What do these stones mean? I think of some significant stones in the Bible. Think of Jacob. There's Jacob, cheat, cheated his brother, cheated his father. He gets found out and has to flee from the anger of his family. And on the way to go to his uncle Laban many miles away, he stopped for the night. And we read in that story in Genesis how Jacob took a stone he used it as a pillow and he went to sleep and had this amazing dream where he saw uh, the Lord. When he woke up, he said, this is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So one stone was all he had, but it made a difference to his life. And he was a changed man. Stones. Or think of the two stone tablets that Moses took up the mountain with the Ten Commandments written on it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if nations and peoples could live their lives in the light of those Ten Commandments, summarised by Jesus, to love God, love your neighbour. If that was to happen, there wouldn't be these conflicts. And then there's Joshua with the twelve stones. It reminds us that God is all-powerful. Stones. And most important stone of all was the stone that rolled away. Jesus crucified, entombed, a stone rolled in over the tomb, great heavy stone, but it's there just for two days and it rolled away and Jesus had left the grave and he rose victorious over sin and death. There's no memorial stone for Jesus, no memorial stone. Of course, there are countless crosses that represent what Jesus did for us. It's not just a memorial of the Saviour's death, the cross. It's a memorial, a reminder that that death is significant for everybody, all time, everywhere, that Jesus died and it rose again. When, when Joshua and the Israelites crossed the Jordan, it was for them a new start in a new land under a new leader. And the cross is a symbol of a new start. Every Christian person has made that new start because they've been to the cross. They've benefited from the stone rolled away. The Christ is alive forevermore. It's a reminder too of the suffering of Jesus in our place, the sacrifice for sin for all time. 
Jesus himself said, greater love has no one than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. He did that. He laid down his life for his friends. He laid down his life for his enemies. He laid down his life for the world. The cross is our guarantee of peace, a peace which the world certainly cannot give or does not seem to have been able to give for all these hundreds of years. So what will the churches of today be doing to teach the children, descendants, what the cross means? The Israelites of old had their 12 stones, their stones told their story. We have the cross and the empty tomb to tell and to teach our story. In these particular testing times, the churches at large have to find new ways of making this message known, this good news of a cross and an empty tomb. And we need to have our answers ready when the question is asked of us, what does Jesus mean? His cross, his empty tomb. Meantime, let's hold on to the words that, G that God gave to Joshua as he went along with those Israelites into the new land. Be strong, be very courageous. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen.
When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow we gave our today. Ever-living God, remember those who have gathered from the storm of war into the peace of your presence. May that same peace calm our fears, bring justice to all peoples, and establish harmony among the nations. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Thank you for joining us for this service this morning. And a huge thank you to everybody who has contributed and participated uh, and made it such a, a rich time. Um, a reminder that at midday we have an Agape Zoom meeting. Uh, please do join us for that if you'd like. Let's finish with a blessing. The Lord bless us and watch over us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord look kindly on us and give us peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.